In this study, we looked at the results of our institution-wide QT alert warning system. It's a first of its kind. There is no other study that, to my knowledge, there's no other institution in the world that systematically alerts any physician who orders an ECG as to what is the QT indicator. The QT interval we know and have known, whether it's due to genetic long QT syndrome or drug-induced long QT syndrome, is a non-invasive risk marker. And so we've set up at really at the calling of the American Heart Association who said, we need to do a better job at preventing in-hospital QT related deaths. And so in response to that call, we created a co automated computerized system where if a patient had a QTC above 500 milliseconds, the physician who ordered that ECG, whether that physician was a general physician, a psychiatrist, or a QT specialist, that physician was a form informed that their patient has a higher risk value. So what we did in this study was to look at what's the results of that? Just how high of risk is it if you own a QTC above a particular at-risk threshold of 500 milliseconds? So we implemented this system in November 2010 and looked at the first seven months of ECGs. Not surprisingly, at Mayo Clinic, there were a lot of ECGs, over 80,000 ECGs performed and over 50,000 patients done during that period of time. 1% had a high risk value. 1% had unexplained QT prolongation over that 500 millisecond threshold. We then looked and said, what was your risk of death if you were a recipient of that high risk QTC warning? and those patients who had a high-risk QTC, those 1%, their risk of death within the first year following that ECG was four times higher than all of the other patients who got all of their other electrocardiograms. In fact, their less than one year mortality was 20%. We then went and looked at and said, but not all QTC above 500 milliseconds, in other words, not all prolonged QT intervals or QT prolongation are created equal. And we identified and developed a pro-QTC score. When we found out that what your score is, in other words, the number of QT prolonging risk factors you had, then correlated and predicted your risk of death. Ranging from 0% risk, if you were a patient of mine who was flagged because your QTC was above 500 because of genetic long QT syndrome, to a risk as high as 40% in less than one year if you had multiple QT prolonging risk factors. Your potassium was out of whack. You were on two, three, four medications with known QT prolonging potential. Those are the highest risk individuals. And we hope now with that information, the next question is, can we identify the high risk individual that answer is yes, we know we can, we've shown that, and we know it's worth identifying them because their risk of sudden death, with, or the risk of death, rather, within the first year of that ECG is very high. Now the question is, can we change that? Can we change their natural history and prolong their life by modifying those at-risk QT variables? by removing QT prolonging drugs that were present, by making sure that physicians don't add a second, a third, a fourth medication with that unwanted side effect. And that remains to be seen, whether we can change the natural history of these individuals, patients at Mayo Clinic, inpatients, outpatients, who cross the 500 millisecond line, and can we change their natural history and prolong their life? So, in this study, we defined a prolonged QT interval that was worthy of being alerted as a QT number, a corrected QT interval or a QTC greater than 500 milliseconds. We know that when the heart's recharging system exceeds that number, that the person has entered into the potential for sudden death, whether that's due to genetic long QT syndrome where there's a genetic glitch in the heart's electrical recharging system, or whether that's due to acquired long QT syndrome, where the heart's recharging system is performing suboptimally because of 
other medical conditions that are aggravating the heart's recharging system, abnormal electrolytes that are bothering the heart's electrical system, or the presence of one of 50, 60 or more FDA approved medications where an unwanted side effect of the medication is to actually prolong the QT interval and set up the potential for a long QT triggered dangerous heart rhythm abnormality. I thought that we would get there. But now the question is, now that we know it's a risk marker, the question is, can we do anything about it? Mm -hmm. um, or have we just non-invasively identified the person whose exit is potentially near? And whether we correct their potassium, correct their magnesium, stop a medication, whether we've thwarted, you know, the reaper, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know. So That's the unknown. Well, I think now we look at and say, now that we... I mean, the next phase of our alert warning system is, is rather exciting. So the new phase, so version number two of Mayo's sudden death warning system is to not only tell the ordering physician, your patient exceeds this QT cutoff, but also to inform them and their pro QTC score is because of the presence of this medicine, this medicine, and this electrolyte abnormality you might want to correct these, you might want to attend to these issues. So once we do that, we'll be able to see, has, is there, has there been a change in physician behavior? And has there been a change in that mortality prediction? Mm -hmm. So if some of these deaths are preventable, then we should see that 19% moving towards the rest of the patients who got an ECG to start to neutralize the QT related mortality. Now, we don't know how many of these deaths are ultimately preventable. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what we have to figure out is, of these alerted patients, how many have a preventable death? Uh, we know who's now most at risk right. to be not here in one year. The question is, is can we lengthen that? Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, do you get a ton of calls? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>